Welcome and Happy New Year. Thank you for joining us today for our first NCAR Explorer Series event, which is a conversation with outreach and training specialist Tim Barnes from UCAR Syed called The Art of Science Communication, Engaging with Communities at NCAR. My name is Dr. Lorena Medina Luna, and I'm an education designer and lead organizer for the NCAR Explorer Series at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, which um, we call NCAR. And it is a world leading organization dedicated to understanding Earth system science, including our atmosphere, weather, climate, the sun, and the importance of all of these systems to our society. I'm really glad to be with you all today to learn more about the work that Tim does at UCAR. For this event, we'll be taking questions throughout the program using the Slido platform. If you scroll down the page, you can see the Slido window just below where you are seeing the live event streaming. Um, and if you haven't already done so, go ahead and click on the join event button. And then you can ask questions on the Q&A tab and answer the poll questions on the polls tab, both of which are found in the blue bar across the top. And be sure to join Slido to add your thoughts to our word cloud question. What do you think of when you hear science communication? Um, and we'll get to that soon. This event is being recorded and it will be available on the NCAR Explorer series website. So if you like it, share it with your family and friends. Um, today we have again, UCAR, Syed, Tim Barnes and Tim, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Hello, it's great. It's great to be here. It's pretty excited. Yeah, and we're all coming to you from our own homes still. Um, so from wherever you are, thank you again for joining. Um, and Tim, let's go ahead and get started. Can you tell me briefly, um, you work at UCAR Center for Science Education, but can you tell me a little bit about what you do at the center? Uh, of course, yeah. So I do work for the UCAR Center for Science Education, and I work at the Mesa Lab, which you see behind me in Boulder, Colorado, on the foothills. And that building is open to the general public. Uh, we have school groups. Uh, my job is to provide visits or tours for school groups and members of the general public. And also uh, during a, a, an open house called Super Science Saturday. And uh, we have lots of resources on our website for, for teachers to use. So it's a combination of different uh, activities that I take play, that I take part in at the, at the Mesa Laboratory. Great, and because of the um, pandemic, it has been closed to the public, but we're hoping um, we can get it back open um, for everybody and we could do these events again in, in the future. Um, but we'll get to do a brief uh, view of a 360 virtual tour later today. So I'm really excited about that. And um, since we were talking about science communication, we did have a word cloud that people are putting information into. Um, so can we actually take a look at what have people been responding for the word cloud of what do you think of when you hear science communication? And we have a lot of information distilling the complexity of scientific results, educational YouTube channels, engaging audiences, comp explaining complexity as simple as possible. Maybe it's daunting for some people, making science accessible, public outreach, engaging, entertaining education, and knowing your audience as well. So these are all great. Thank you so much, everybody, and continue to put them up on Slido. We'll, we'll keep a record of it. Um, and so, Tim, how do you approach the types of science communication that are out there? Well, I thank you, Lauren. I, I, I'm really excited to see in that word cloud uh, the, the different challenges in doing science communication. And I saw the word complexity in there. And that's, that's a key piece of science communication for me is the complexity of conveying what it is that uh, will help people grow 
in, in a way. So uh, my job is to, when I see, a, when, I, when I'm interacting with someone to design a way of communicating that is good for them. And that's really hard to do because I've never met these individuals before. So there's different approaches with the school groups. It's pretty straightforward. There's some, some standard ways of managing school groups that the, the students are used to that. So uh, offering that or, or welcoming them with the same type of um, interaction, the, the management, having everyone, you see some of these children sitting on the floor. We come in and we gather and uh, we set some rules, which they're used to, like um, walking in the building and using an inside voice. And one of the things you, you might notice is that they're sitting on the floor. So I sit on the floor with them because that's a way of letting them know that I'm not trying to, to you know, be like um, someone the same as their teacher because it's going to be a little bit of a different experience. They're allowed to, as they're exploring in the building, actually touch things, which typically when they might go on a school uh, field trip, they're told you have to be quiet, you can't run, and you can't touch anything either. That's the difference in their, their experience. So try to welcome them in a way that they're used to, but at the same time indicate things are a little bit different. Like I'm sitting on the floor with you. And one of the things I always ask them is like, what are some of the rules? And they'll go through the typical ones and then, they, then they'll almost always say, well, we can't touch things. And I'm like, well, that's different here. You actually get to touch while you're exploring in the building. And then that works with school groups. Of course, there's always some, you know, things that pop up unexpectedly. And I can talk about that later, about how to, how to deal with um, unexpected events. But then moving to adults, having members of the general public, I think one of the most important things to keep in mind is that this is a non, this is a, uh, uh, they, they volunteered to come. They are not captive. They can leave whenever they want. So it's very important to remember that and meet them where they are. And it may not be that they are, they were interested in coming. It, 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 they might've brought someone and they weren't really excited about being there. So I have to consider like, where are they when they arrive? And and speak to them as adults or um, in wherever they are in their uh, lifespan. Maybe they're young adults, maybe they're senior adults, um, maybe they're scientists, maybe they have no idea uh, how scientists do their work or the difference between science and engineering. So I have to address them uh, on, on their level playing field. And it, ta it takes a while to understand where, they're act where they actually are coming from. And then continue to engage them uh, through the whole process of their visit. And that can be 20 minutes, it could be an hour and a half. And then the last part is kind of special and that's our approach to our general public event, Super Science Saturday. And that involves science educators like myself in UCAR and NCAR, but also staff who are very interested in sharing with uh, the general public, but they're not always sure how to do that. So we approach it from an entertainment standpoint, like let's have some fun and let's also do some science in there and distill the difference between science and magic and then offer them the, the opportunity to ask questions. It's rather informal. We dress in costumes to, to let everyone know like, hey, you know, this is a big part of science is imagining and exploring and trying things new. So with Super Science Saturday, it's a pretty spectacular way of engaging people in different ways. That's so awesome. Thank you so much, Tim. Sounds like you go from K through gray in your outreach, um, engaging with different audiences. Oh yes, definitely. And I saw that the Super Science Saturday the past two years, it's been virtual. So that's been pretty awesome to see. And I think the videos are still available um, for people to, to watch them. Yes, they are. So if you, that's one of the things you can, you can relive those experiences uh, with us from our, in our new virtual work. This is our virtual studio. We've been able to uh, pivot, as everyone always says, to 
helping educate, but in a virtual space. And uh, we've done a great deal. We have a brand new virtual studio, which was a, a, an amazing addition to our capacity to do science education. And we're now reaching international and national audiences on a regular basis. That's awesome. And it's cool that we're able to do that now. And I mean, you know, people were doing it before as well, but I think for us, um, it's been a big, big change. It has for me at least, because <laughs> um, I miss seeing everybody in person. I know there's a lot of people that would come and um, I'm hoping we get to, to experience um, the NCAR Mesa Lab in person again, but um, we do have a 360 virtual tour in case anybody does miss the, the facilities. And if they haven't visited the facilities, um, would you be able to tell us a little bit about, like, do you work with other labs? Um, did you create, like, how, how did it come about? <laughs> um, you know, in all of those pivots, we realized that it was important to still offer the same rich content. And as you said, we missed having people in person and had to consider like, how do we connect with people in a virtual world the same way we might in person? And the answer is we can't do it the same way, but we can do that by learning about the work that's going on in, in different ways, asking different questions and highlighting those bits and pieces and collaborating with other parts of our organization is key. The, the idea of having a virtual tour was, was absolutely um, brilliant. And the, the people who thought of that idea, when I was, when they brought it up to me, I was like, okay, that sounds fantastic, but it's gonna be a heavy technological lift and we're gonna need some help. And funny enough, our computational and information systems lab, which we call Sizzle, was also interested in doing uh, the same type of work, but you know, the COVID shutdowns put us right at the right at the forefront. So we collaborated with Sizzle, got a 360-degree camera, and now we have a 360 virtual tour of the NCAR facilities. And here we are, we're right in it. There, I'm standing virtually in the driveway of the Mesa Laboratory. And some of you have already been to the Mesa Lab, and you won't be surprised about what, what you see maybe there are some new things. So I'm gonna show people who haven't seen what it's like inside, what it does look like, and then highlight the new features that some of you haven't seen. As a matter of fact, I know you haven't seen the one that's right behind me, right here. <laughs> I'm in a virtual space. Now this is a recognition of all of the work that our Earth observing laboratory. These are the, the observational scientists because it's great to like conceptualize what's going on, but until you actually get out there and collect data in whatever you're, you're studying, don't really know for sure. So the and all you have to do is simply press the screen and you're there. And this is our brand new Earth Observing uh, our field campaign uh, exhibit. This is the interface, what it looks like. If you look up above, you'll notice there are some buttons right here. You can press those buttons. It'll take you to different field campaigns. And those field campaigns give us a great deal of information of what it's like to be in the field. You can do this virtually in the 360 tour. And when we open again, you can do that in person. One of the most interesting things is you'll find out about equipment like the NCAR C-130, nicknamed Hercules, uh, if you look carefully, you might notice at the bottom of this aircraft, it's typically used for military purposes. This one's not. This one is designed specifically for science. And at the bottom are some of the sensing, uh, some of the tubes are used for literally drawing in air in the aircraft to take measurements. So this is one of the uh, experiences that you'll have when you take that virtually or you see us in uh, take the tour virtually or see us in person. And just to give you an example, I'm going to press on one of these buttons, see what comes up. Pressing, pressing. <laughs> and here is a description of what you'll, what the field campaign is, uh, so you can explore a little more deeply. So I'm really excited about people having the opportunity to do that, but that's not all that's new in the 
virtual visit. So we'll head back and look around a little bit more. Just over here, we have some stairs. I'm gonna walk up the stairs. And there, here we are <laughs> on the Mesa. Now behind me, what you'll notice is, um, right over here, is a, what looks like a satellite. And that's because that is a satellite. When we closed down, hanging from the ceiling, was a scale model of the Cosmic One satellite. This is Cosmic Two. And these satellites are amazing in what they have, or how they have advanced our understanding of Earth system science. What you're experiencing now is our virtual object. This is a uh, 3D representation of Cosmic Two. You can see probably what is familiar here, solar panels. And if you look uh, on here, you'll see GNSS, that's GPS. This is one of the many technologies that NCAR and UCAR can create or, or a 3D map representation of it. It is amazing in that it provides three robust data sets that are really revolutionizing the way we understand planet Earth. Cosmic One was launched in 2006. And Cosmic 2 was launched in 2000, uh, 2017. And all of those data, or there are six of them in each of these constellations, and there were enough of them operating at the end uh, by 2017 that our data set has continued, uh, has been brought down continuously, allowing us to understand the upper atmosphere, better understand severe weather, because the way Cosmic work, it, it, can, it can read humidity inside of clouds from space. Absolutely amazing. And it also gives us the most uh, robust climate record for the entire planet. All those data are shared worldwide. So you can come in, you can ex explore with Cosmic 2 virtually and our 3D object, but you can also come into the building and see it in person. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And I thought we would walk up to our final. Uh, we're going to walk through the building a little bit. Here we are, walking through the building. Now we're up on our climate floor, and you'll see this is where we have information about the history of climate, climate change, and some of what's happening currently. And then as we make our way down to the end of the hallway, there's climate basics, and then keep turning around. Right here, what you'll see is the entrance to uh, Sound and Climate, which is a musical interface for one of the most robust data sets in the world from a very large ensemble run, which means a lot of scientists put these, put these data together. But the new, new thing about sound and climate is that it's now online. So here we are. If I press one of the buttons like this, it takes us right to the interface of sound and climate. And this is the online version. Within this version, you can select some of the data right by touching the screen. These are six different versions of what will happen or has happened and will happen at the North Pole. And with sea ice, you can also look at surface temperature changes and precipitation. And every time it changes, it sounds different because this is a musical interface. All of those changing data are represented by different musical instruments, change the speed of the, how, how fast it's quote unquote played and slow down. Uh, I would love for people to just close their eyes and listen to see or to experience um, climate data, which is one of the things you can do with sounding climate. And that's a brief kind of foray into what is offered in the um, sounding climate. But you can, and then just keep in mind, you can access this 360 virtual visit for free anytime on our website. To explore, but you can also, this is new, Lorena, I don't know if you've heard about this, but you can also sign up for a free guided tour with me. Yes, you're going to have a group tour of at least eight people starting on March 7th. And we're going to offer a free online public tour for the first, on the first Monday of each month at noon for anyone to join as well. So there's two different ways you can actually take a tour with me. That's so great because I miss going on tours with you um, and being able to just explore and learn like every tour is unique and different. And every time I was able to follow you around, I would just learned something new. So I'm so excited that our guests can join you still. 
coming up. Um, and if any, if everybody um, is on, if you're not on Slido, go ahead and um, go on Slido on the top left of the screen of Slido, you'll see three dashed lines. And there we have a couple of links um, for the sound, the listening to climate, the travel, um, and then the taking a self-guided tour as well. And then um, links to how to get to um, join Tim on a live tour as well. Um, and Tim, we did have a question from the audience, which I could just read out. Um, we don't have to, oh, there it is, yeah. So the question I'm gonna take um, first was, uh, because we just talked about the 360 tour, is what platform do you use for your virtual 360 tour? Uh, that is ThingLink, and it's an amazing platform that provides for us the capacity to um, to modify an app without making a huge, um, because it was new, and like without making a, 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 a huge investment in in this, it, it allowed us to do this in baby steps. But it's amazingly robust for what we're trying to do. Great, thank you. And I did see that we had a second question. Um, as you went through the tour, we you mentioned that there's a whole floor about climate and the changing climate, and I wonder, you know. Um, how do you handle negativity or skepticism uh, from guests or, you know, in general? I, I'm so glad someone asked because that's the elephant in the room. Uh, because there are people who are just not okay with the idea that the, it could be that the climate system is changing. They're like, it's not actually changing. That, that's that's way, the way that they perceive the world. And then there are also people who, just have it, their understanding is that there's no way humans could have that big of an impact. And I completely understand these, um, these observations. And the way I handle it is to listen to them and understand what is it they, that actually is problematic for them. And the first one of understanding if the climate system is actually changing gets to the question of, whether these weather events that we're, whether the weather events we're seeing are the result of climate change. And even climatologists will say like, not everything is a result of climate change, but there are some that are specifically a result of that because historically um, in written records and then by going backwards in time with the community earth system model, which is one of the most respected simulations of climatology or climate in the world, we can go backwards in time and have it give us a peek into what maybe was going on in uh, historically or in ancient climate, and then see if we can find proxies that represent that. Stromatolites are some of the oldest living things on the planet, and I believe they can go back like 800, so it's 800 billion, if not a trillion, uh, not a trillion a billion years. Um, and they're very simple, but these these very old objects help us understand how close our simulations are to representing what has gone on on the planet, and then look at today, compare it to today, and then look into the future. And there are things that don't show up in many of the different records. So I point out for people who are, who are thinking like, it's not actually changing. I point out things that can only be explained. Like in 2003, there was a, a set of heat, a heat wave that was extraordinary and couldn't be explained by anything other than excessive heat. And if that excessive heat continues, then, then we have a problem. But historically, there was no, there's no physical representation or physical reason for that to happen outside of artificially putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So I bring up, and I, I'm, I'm just providing what climatologists would offer in response to a question like, is it actually changing? And then there's people who are pretty sure that humans couldn't possibly be driving this change. And then I point out that that is that is the that's the starting point for climatologists. They say, well, if something's going on and it's this, let's prove it's not that. So they're constantly trying to work out how this could happen, the climate change that we see how it could happen uh, in some other way. And 
even to the point of looking at cosmic rays. Could cosmic rays actually be changing the temperature on the planet on planet Earth? And it's not a new, this is not a new um, question. These are not new questions. So I present to people who are skeptical the reality that scientists are skeptical. They come up with an idea and then they spend most of their time trying to figure out if that could actually be right. And if it's wrong, they find out how it's wrong. And there, that's just one piece is climate change. But there are a lot of people who are pretty sure that there's a, and there are airplanes spraying them with mind control chemicals. And I, I talked to them about what that would require and the dynamics of the atmosphere, what's, what's going on up above. And I, again, people will understand what they're going to understand. I try to provide to them answers to questions that scientists have and then Hopefully they take that with them. One of the fantastic things about the visitor center at the Mesa Lab is that it's an environment that provides information that's accessible to a large population uh, of people. And people will decide for themselves where they stand. One of the other important things to listen for is what value structure people have. That's where the conversation goes for me, is let's talk about the, the value that you hold and how that uh, plays out in relationship to climate change. So that's a long answer, but that's how I uh, deal with that question. No, it's great because I think that's the important part is being able to listen to each other and have open conversations, being able to take in information and then kind of that leads to new questions, right? And hopefully new scientists who will tackle those questions. Um, so if you're a young scientist and are interested in this type of work, you're definitely in the right space to be able to still answer unknown questions. Um, so I'm really excited about that. And one of the things I was um, interested to see in the 360 tour was that you had uh, aircraft. So it's about field campaigns. And we do have a lot of videos on our NCAR Explorer series field campaigns webpage um, where people can explore uh, the videos of what it's like to be in the field. But as part of your work with um, UCAR Syed, you also have a program called Meet the Experts, which I saw on March 3rd, you're going to be talking in collaboration with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science about aircraft and um, people who specialize on research airplanes and aviation. So I'm really excited um, for that program and people can check out if you um, go on our website for um, Meet the Experts with Syed. Um, to, to be able to explore that program. And one question we also had about accessible materials um, for elementary school students is where could people access that material? The materials for school groups? Um, it says, where could I access educational materials for elementary school students? That would be right on the SIED website. We have a very robust collection of offerings for teachers and I'll step back a little bit so you can see this is just a glimpse of what's a, what's available and we we have recently and if you're a teacher you might not recognize this interface we we've, we've just upgraded and been very and uh, intentionally been much more clear about how to down those resources <laughs> sorry download those resources you can see uh, hurricane resilience project resilience Globe Weather is an incredibly robust um, collection of materials. If you want to take a deep dive into weather, the, those will support the, your interest. But if you are at a level where you're maybe a pre-K or K level, there are some materials that are much more simple that you can also download from uh, our website. And again, on that Slido interface, if you go on it, there's those three lines. There's also um, a link that you can, can um, click on to get to these resources. Thank you, Tim. Sure. And um, you know, we have the virtual tour. It's gonna be available whether or not the MESA lab is open to the public. Um, and there was a question, do you think that the lab will be open to visitors in 2022? 
And I think um, I can answer a little bit. I think we're working on it. Um, we're a federally funded agency. So we're um, a little bit going into, um, we have a whole working team that is responsive for saying when it's appropriate for our facility to open to the public. Um, so I know it's, it's in the works and crossing our fingers <laughs> that 2022 will be a year of re-entry for everyone. Um, but we'll definitely make those announcements on our social media page and on our website when we have more information. But um, I don't know, Tim, if you, if you wanted to add on to that. Yeah, Lorena, that's as clear as it can be at this point. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's what the, this pandemic has added is a lot of uncertainty. And being the uh, being a science laboratory, we follow the science and when it's right and okay, then we will be open to open again. And unfortunately it's just not yet. And we don't know, but we will know when it's clear and hopefully that's in 2022. Um, so we're not taking it lightly. We, we respect everyone's safety, the staff who are in the building, the visitors who come to us uh, and uh, people who work uh, temporarily there. So we're, we're making sure that the coast is clear before we do uh, open the building again. Thank you. And I look forward to being able to see you again. It would be awesome. Yeah. And then um, in addition to the virtual work that you're doing, I heard that there's some work being done for visually impaired accessibility to museum spaces. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. We do. We, we have we have the with baby steps, we are moving into that realm, and our director John Rizky is um, leading the way. Has expertise in that area uh, that he will lend towards continuing to offer uh, or help us offer to the visually impaired. We do have something that is quite classic already available, and it's even wheelchair accessible, and that is a copy of one of the largest hailstones to fall from the sky. In 1970, the Coffeeville, Kansas hailstone fell and was recovered by Charlie Knight, one of our scientists, and put in a freezer and then cut open to verify that it was a single hailstone. Turns out it is, it went in the Guinness Book of World Records. It weighed 1.67 pounds. And this is a copy that you're seeing on the trunk of a Honda Accord from Denver that had a little hail damage. But you can reach up and touch it. This is a plaster copy of that same hailstone. I'll hold that up so maybe you can see it a little bit better. Now the spikes on the top of it are something that if you are visually challenged, you might not expect with what you've heard is a sphere of ice. And these spikes are due to the water freezing as this hailstone dropped. This was the bottom. The top has these spikes on it and there the crystals are froze. So this is one of the items that we have began to explore with. And this is not just for the visually impaired. impaired. Everyone um, will, can run their hands over this and tell like, oh, this is what an incredibly large hailstone might be like. We also have in the exhibit, because it's our architecture is a big uh, draw for people to come to the building. I am Pei is world famous, and this was the building that he created that elevated his career to where he uh, went and unfortunately passed away in 2017. But um, there's some unique characteristics. This building arguably is the first building of the postmodern era, and that is a result of him using a treatment on the side of a building called bush hammering. And it just might sound a little odd, but that's a, a metal chisel that goes on the bottom of a pneumatic hammer. And it was used to grade the sides of these of the building. If you've ever wondered about, if you have been to the building and looked at that corduroy texture, that's where it came from. We have a uh, replica of the bush hammer on display now, again, a wheelchair uh, accessible. And you can run your hands across that chisel and, and get an idea of what tool was used in order to create that texture. And you can also just run your hand along the, because some of the former outside of the building is inside the visitor center. So you can, you can feel the surface uh, that resulted from using that bush hammer. We, one of my favorites that we have is called the Sea of Clouds. 
And this is an exceptional exhibit from the Exploratorium in San Francisco that we adapted to Colorado because it didn't quite work uh, like they thought it would at sea level. And our staff modified it so it puts out a, a massive amount of cloud droplets. And this is not evaporated, it's recondensed, or the, the water is condensed from the mister in the base of it and literally fills up this tub, which is about a meter and a half across. And you can put your hands in there and touch a cloud and move that cloud around and experience what it might be like if you could be in the atmosphere in a cloud. Um, and it, it makes different types of clouds. Like in the middle, you might see a little cumulonimbus and on the outside, a little KH waves. Um, which means a lot more when you start exploring with clouds, but this is one of those, that's one of the exhibits that you can, uh, that's, that's accessible, that you can feel. Uh, you can actually feel that cloud. The last one is our white light coronal camera from our, uh, the group that we call High Altitude Observatory, the Earth Sun Earth Connections Group. And in our, right in our virtual tour, you can get a look at it as you walk by it and, um, see that it's it's fully accessible. You put your hands right on that instrument and um, know that it's something that went out to the field and give an idea of what it was like to machine that uh, instrument. So uh, the hailstone, the bush hammer, the sea of clouds, and the white light coronal camera. And we are still considering other ways that we can honestly make things that are more accessible to the visually impaired. That's awesome. And I had also heard um, that NCAR and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture have teamed up to develop augmented reality application for use in museums and exhibit spaces, which I think is going to be um, really great for accessibility um, purposes. So I'm glad to hear that we're doing things at the Mesa Lab and nationally. And I wanted to ask, you know, you do a lot of engagement in education and science, but I wanted to ask, how did you get interested in working in informal science education? So it started when I was in, in high school, I, I, I did forensics, which is public speaking. And later on, actually worked as a, a critic, uh, a judge, if you will, for a high school speech and debate. And really had to learn to listen to arguments. And by arguments, I mean, people put together um, descriptions of why they think as they do. And after I graduated high school, I enlisted in the US Navy where I learned even more types of logic uh, as I was trained to work on advanced avionics. And some of you are wondering what I'm talking about. You might remember from the movie Top Gun. If you saw Top Gun, here's a picture of Tom Cruise. And standing next to him is Sundown. He's the Rio, the radar intercept officer. He sat in the back of the F-14 and actually worked on the weapon system, which is incredibly complicated. This is a picture of the inside. And I was trained to understand how this system works electronically and interfaces with the mechanical parts of the plane and the human to fix this in a very short amount of time uh, through logic. I had to understand like what should be happening and what's not, and if it's not happening, why isn't it happening? And then from there, I was lucky enough to receive a scholarship to the University of Colorado where I earned my degree in communication, which involved organizational communication, family communication, inter, uh, interpersonal, or, um, and uh, public speaking. <laughs> which I'm still learning how to do. Uh, and one of the takeaways from that is that when humans are interacting with one another, 80% of what they're communicating is nonverbal. And something that a Canadian philosopher by the name of Marshall McLuhan has said, or said in his understanding of the experience on Earth, is that the medium is the message. How you say what you're saying, how you present, the colors you use, the inflection you use, how you do that is shows your honesty. If you're if you're being sincere in your communication, uh, then it shows and it will move you forward. Which helped me when I started working in the child clinical psychology lab after graduating and helping children who were not 
not reaching their full potential in class who had challenges communicating. Uh, I worked with some incredible uh, graduate students. I was an undergrad. Uh, and we literally had to understand what it was that would help them refocus. And part of that was being able to communicate their needs. What we accidentally found out is that if there is an adult that really cares about them and they communicate with that person, it helps them calm down uh, and self-regulate. Uh, it's, it's called polybagel theory today. Uh, and luckily I was there to see that it actually works. If you can have uh, teach children to, to look at someone in, when they're communicating and say things that are important and have the person with whom they're speaking recognize those bits and pieces and breathe through their nose, all of these actually help calm down the parasympathetic nervous system, which is part of what I'm doing when I'm interfacing. I mentioned earlier, sometimes there are discipline, there are challenges with school groups, and there's little people who just are having a rough time, and that's when that uh, those skills kick in. And I got excited about NCAR because when I started working at NCAR, I wasn't really restricted on how uh, I approach the interaction with individuals. And that really led to um, where I am today with these three different ways of approaching groups is I, I, I call on those different experiences to, to understand an argument logically, um, do a communication that's honest. And if someone's just having a hard time, you know, maybe it's time to wait. And that, that little person or maybe some the older person who's having a rough day, it's maybe we talk about how hard the day is in an, you know, an appropriate way um, and leave it at that. So I really liked working because at NCAR I got the, the, the opportunity to really explore my interest in complex systems and through communication. That's awesome. And it's it sounds like it was an intense um, training that you had up on the plane and being able to figure things yeah. out. And I'm glad you were able to talk about a couple of um, advice for communicating with the public because we have a question from Osamu and um, on Slido. And the question had said, do you have any advice for young scientists on how to better communicate their work or field with the public? And I think you might've touched upon some of that already. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And one of one of the most important things that we kind of overlook is listening. And if you're going to do your research, find out what your audience is, what their background might be uh, as best you can. And, and, you know, don't be invasive, but kind of know who your audience is. That's a key piece. And as the interaction progresses, if you have someone Who's like that? That's your nonverbal cue to be like, I'm not interested in opening up to you. So notice that, or if they're leaning forward in their chair, watch these nonverbal cues and then listen to what they say. If they say something like, I just don't believe it, then it's, it's not about the logic. It's not about the data. It's all about why they don't believe it. Uh, and these are the things that will help you communicate is keep your message simple and something that uh michael mickey glance who was one of uh, the mentors that i had and oh my goodness catherine hayhoe well, these are science communicators that are uh you know idols that i, I follow and of course warren washington who's uh, like the father of climate change uh and works at NCAR. And one of the things that they do is they present the science in a way that's accessible and that might mean telling stories and those stories can also have metaphors in them so what for what you're trying to convey for you, the young scientist try explaining it to someone who is not really interested and this this is this is before you communicate to the audience that your target audience find um your grandpa or your neighbor next door or the bus driver not the bus driver whether they're driving but somebody who has a moment to listen to you practice on them and your elevator speech is key. You want, you want some quick points. You want to know that they're listening to you. You want some quick, simple points, a story, and metaphors. And that will take you a long, long ways. The other thing to, to remember is stop talking at some point. <laughs> because, you know, once you've, once you've gotten 
you know, acknowledgement that they are with you and there. Awesome. Thank you so much. And um, uh, because you mentioned a couple of different types of um, thinking processes, there's a question from John that asks, how does your organization use design thinking to research, develop, and launch your communications? Uh, that's a the universal design is our regular conversation with us. And that means we need to consider all possible um, takers, if you will, or audiences that we're producing for, and then what our capacity is to meet those needs. And like with the visually accessible um, exhibits, we're still, we're still being very careful that we can meet the needs of people who, uh, the, the, the science has to be brought forward and people's capacity, their, their abilities have to be addressed as well. And designing for those people is one of the reasons why we move in iterations. And when we finally come up with a, a, an exhibit or an offering or a resource, they are very well respected, these, these offerings that we have, but it did not come easily. Super Science Saturday, we spend a great deal of time um, discussing what words should we use and how should we use those. The, I'll give you one example. We, we were with a group of scientists who are atmosphere experts, and one of them said, well, let's talk about how warm air holds more water, and the others were like, yeah, that's not actually true. So that discussion went on for I think an hour and a half um, and then a couple of days. And that's one of those little tiny bits and pieces that you might not think is important, but it's key. And we have such a diverse group of researchers at NCAR and uh, the population of the staff is becoming more diverse, which it needs to. Um, there are other issues about science literacy and underserved populations. If we come at people who have never had the opportunity to um, engage in earth system sciences, if we come at them with uh, materials that were designed for people who've been better served and they don't immediately take what we are providing, then we haven't done our job. So a lot of what we're doing is spending time listening to those who have said, you know, We've, no one's ever really paid to paid attention to us uh, before, so we don't really care about what you're offering because it's not designed for us. And then we have to say, like, okay, what is it that resonates with you, and what can we do? Um, so design thinking is very much of what we're doing, and reaching the underserved is something we haven't done well, but we hope to do much better in the future. Great, thank you, Tim. And I know we have still a couple of more topics to touch upon, but I wanted to ask um, if you can answer really briefly one of the questions from Adriana that we received. And they're watching from Canada and it asks, what is your advice for people working in science communication that come across restrictions such as budgets being low priority, et cetera? Uh, restrictions, budget, budgets being, oh, so I'm, I'm guessing that means like, um, there's not necessarily enough budget for science communication. If I get that correct, um, yeah. incorrect, let me know. Um, the one of the one of the fantastic qualities of science is that it's everywhere, and it is possible. And I mentioned metaphors and stories. It's also very important to find simple ways to represent what it is you're communicating. You don't have the budget to do some, uh, to do very uh, elaborate visuals. Um, do what you can uh, with those visual pieces and then augment with what you might have that's already available. If you are, if it's chemistry that you're trying to highlight, there are professionals who can volunteer with you to, to describe um, the chemistry on a basic level. And they, they might not be used to doing that. Uh, so you might have to teach them that it, to, to be very short, <laughs> that's what they do. 
but I would I would say use resources that are available. Use what you have, and think about how what you want to convey is available with with the budget that's available, and also virtually. Um, it's growing the capacity to do work virtually as a piece, um, and look for local experts. If uh, if you want to reach a population that can't get to you, find people who are there who you could also train. Mentoring is a big piece of that. Great, thank you. And talking about mentoring, um, I know that in addition to the work that you do for the public, you also work with a program called the Undergraduate Leadership Workshop, um, which is for students. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Then undergrads, undergraduates in uh, Earth System Sciences or at a university who are interested in Earth System Sciences really don't have a great, uh, great opportunities to find out what professional researchers do. The undergraduate leadership workshop uh, is designed to bring in those students with advice from their, their department on what it is or which students they think would benefit greatly from learning more about their careers. And what you're watching right now is an interaction. These are the undergraduate uh, leadership workshop students interfacing with former uh, ULW participants who are now broadcast meteorologists. So all of the undergraduates in the room have a personal audience with people who are doing what they're thinking of doing. So the ULW is to, number one, to let the students ask questions about what their career field might look like, but also to build their uh, leadership capacity. So here they are. This is a young lady in the ULW who'd never launched a weather balloon before. So the undergraduates who had were like, oh, you definitely need to do this. And we're out at the Center for Severe Weather Research with storm chasers have all kinds of equipment so they get to see where these researchers work. And they also need to be able to work well with one another. And the center of this group pointing is Olga Tweedy, who is an amazing uh, career scientist right now. But when she was in the undergraduate leadership workshop, she used her skills to build uh, team, uh, leadership skills and teamwork skills to train other groups. She literally came back for, for follow on years of undergraduate students to help them gain a better understanding of what teamwork looks like uh, and leadership to, to learn leadership skills. And speaking about leadership, I'm gonna um, ask about the work that you do outside of NCAR. Um, you are um, doing a lot. You are the city of Lafayette um, counselor, you're in the city of Lafayette um, board. Can you tell us um, what you what you do? Thank you. Yes, I, I was elected to the Lafayette City Council, which is about nine miles outside of Boulder, in a uh, population of thirty thousand individuals. And one of my big concerns is uh, preparing for the impacts of climate change, and I, I couldn't sit still and not try to help my local municip municipality. And with incredible support from other community members. I was elected and now go through uh, bi-weekly and kind of pretty much every day, there's a little bit of piece of discussions that we have about how the city should move forward. And we have, a, we have discussions about the basics of how the city should operate, but also I try as often as I can to infuse an understanding of how what we do is preparing or to not preparing us for climate change impacts, looking at vulnerability and, and resilience, uh, underrepresented and underserved populations that live in our community are, are disproportionately impacted. So I hope to continue to bring that up. Housing, transportation, climate change, water, these are all issues that are going to be exacerbated, exacerbated uh, in the future. So I try to be that voice of saying, hey, you know what, we need to really be honest about um, what can happen and uh, how underserved populations are not getting their needs met and could get worse. And for the work that you do, you recently um, received the Boulder County Multicultural Award. And also at UCAR, um, you received an Outstanding Accomplishment in Diversity Award. <laughs> um, so congratulations for that. And thank you so much for speaking up. That's so awesome. Thank you, yes, and I, the Diversity Award was for um, supporting the African and African Americans that are within the Earth System Sciences, specifically at NCAR and UCAR. 
And that's something I learned over time is that the population of African and African Americans in the Earth System Sciences and in the city of Boulder has not increased since the 1960s. And what I've learned over time is that that's because there's not a resilient community to support uh, us. And I, I, under the guidance of uh, Dr. Warren Washington, who is an amazing influence on the Earth System Sciences and has been and still is, um, I thought maybe we should build more community. And it came to be that we were the first employee resource group and uh, it's still growing and we provide guidance, policy guidance on how to continue to recruit and support African and African Americans, uh, again, at NCAR and across the Earth System Sciences. So really appreciative of that recognition. Uh, I would have done it anyway, so, but it's nice to get the award. That's amazing. I'm so glad because I think that's the important part is being ha having that community of support wherever you might be and being able to bring your whole self into your workspace. And yeah, it's it's so important. So thank you for, for all of your work. Um, and because we're coming up to close to the end of our program here, I wanted to ask if you can tell us a little bit about what projects are you excited about um, moving forward? Ooh, um, well, uh, one of my, <laughs> I, I have to say, I'm super excited about having people come back to the, the building and explore and continuing to uh, engage with individuals virtually and growing with the, the awareness that it's possible to interact with our Earth system but also to be uh, aware of uh, the impacts of climate and climate change. And with that said, there are a lot of, there's a lot of research going into actually intervening in our climate system in order to correct the, um, the misalignment, if you will, or the, 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 the problems with our climate system, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So NCAR, a group of very concerned scientists at NCAR have reached out to their colleagues and created the uh, Community Climate Intervention Strategies Research Program. And these are people who understand that natural systems don't function in silos. There's a great deal of interaction. And if one were to adjust one part of the system, that necessarily is going to impact other parts of the system. And because we're talking about a planetary extinction event, potentially, um, it's very, very important to do this wisely. And they, they have said, we will cross lines. We're gonna work outside of our silo with scientists that we never worked with before to understand what they're doing. This is, a, it's a huge communication piece. And I'm involved with the steering committee for that effort to say, how do we talk to people that we haven't talked to before about their research to ensure that uh, the science community is very aware of what's going on around them in, in regards to climate, climate change. And with that said, well, we also are moving towards bringing in an additional online exhibit in the Mesa Lab that is based on output from, as I mentioned earlier, the Community Earth System Model, CESM. And just behind me, right, <laughs> there it is. We're in the virtual world. This one is called Choose Our Future. And it uses the worst case scenario uh, in a climate change environment to allow individuals to experiment with the way they live their lives. The inputs are right here. You can add those inputs to the system to see what, what it positively impacts our future. And those are ways that you literally can live your life uh, differently based on what the science data is. This is uh, was brought to us by our uh, climate research scientists. They said, we need to have the public understand what is and what isn't uh, really impactful to climate change. Well, for the longest time, it's been sitting here on the floor for people to visit, uh, to use when they're visiting, but we will have an online version of that. Um, stay tuned, that's still coming. It's uh, being adapted. So I'm super excited for the online version of Choose Our Future. Thank you so much, Tim. And um, just to close up, I wanted to ask if you had any final thoughts or comments um, for our audience. Um, yeah, I, I would like to 
acknowledges and what i'm learning is that there are bodies of knowledge that uh have existed for a long period of time and i'd like to recognize that i live and work on the traditional territory of the arapaho cheyenne sioux and ute and colorado's front range is a contemporary traditional site of trade and gathering for many indigenous peoples and I, as we reach out to different um populations uh in in uh, in our efforts to to bring in more diverse populations to keep in mind that traditional eco ecological knowledge has a great deal for us to learn um, and you know the communication styles the the way that uh, indigenous populations see our planetary system is a place for me to grow and i encourage everyone to take a second look at uh, where you are and who was there before you and try to understand what it is that maybe you haven't even seen yet. Great, thank you so much, Tim. And thank you everybody for joining us. I saw that there was a former ULW participant here, Karen. Um, so he said, thanks, Tim. And thank you again, everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Tim, for sharing about your experiences, your work that you're doing, that your whole team is doing. Um, and Car U Car, and I look forward to exploring the virtual world and hopefully seeing all of you um, in the future back at the Mesa Lab. And if you come travel to Colorado once it's open, we'll we'll look forward to seeing you at that time as well. With that, we'll say goodbye. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, everybody. Um, Aliyah, Dan, Brett, Katie, for supporting this program, and we'll see you at the next event.